Um, first, I have to make sure the pages can actually come apart. That would be embarrassing. But uh, let's open with a prayer first. Father God, we thank you so much for the time we have together. Uh, thank you for this family. Thank you for this congregation. And uh, be with us this morning as we worship. And be with us as we go forward from wherever we're going. And help us to, again, trust that you will hold us fast. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And so this is sort of written out like a letter. I was having fun. It's like a New Testament letter because why not? I'm just that nerdy. But so that's why it's written out. And because I don't know if I can make it through. So we'll try this. So to the Church of Christ, Northwest in Peoria, Illinois, peace be upon you all. And may our glorious God and Father pour out mercies unnumbered in your midst, and may our Lord Christ Jesus' faithfulness never leave you, and may the Holy Spirit's presence flood your hearts and your lives. And may you continue to seek out the triune God with fervor and love as you bring about the establishment of the kingdom of Jesus Christ. I would encourage you, my brothers and sisters, on this final day of fellowship, while I rest assured that the bonds that tie us together are woven through eternity as the one who has bound us together is eternal, and that I will see many of you again at some point in the future, now does come the end of a particular season. And I sincerely pray to Almighty God that as the next season dawns, that it brings you nothing but growth, peace, and wonders beyond imagining. My beloved, you are my heart and my joy. I came to you a young, naive man full of idealism and no real experience to speak of. And now I leave you slightly older, having experienced some of the highest peaks and darkest valleys of my life. And thanks to you, I leave, I pray, a little wiser, a little kinder, and a little more experienced. And while my idealism somehow remains, by the grace of God, untarnished, you have been used by God in his wisdom to help pair that idealism with a healthy portion of reality. I generally do say that with thanks and a little bit of snark, but that's me for you, so. And I thank God for you daily. And I will continue to pray for you that you may know Jesus evermore. And I pray that for all who come into this fellowship, that you are as much of a blessing to them as you have been to me. Now, I would encourage you not to forget who you are in Christ. Too often, you define yourselves by your faults and your failings, by the mistakes of the past, and by what you have not yet achieved. Now, there is goodness and worth in confronting old sins, and you've got to get rid of them, take care of that quick. However, the failings of the past are not your identity. You are not defined by the scars of your sins, but by the scars of the crucified one. So, my brothers and sisters, you must learn to live in the tension of two distinct truths. You are a collection of sinners, broken and in need of healing. You are also the bride of Christ, the radiance of his splendor and hope to the nations. And it is not I who call you that. That would be Jesus, the one who has the power to renew and reconcile anyone who trusts in his name. So let Christ crucified and risen be your purpose and identity. If your purpose is anything less than Christ crucified and risen, then what are you doing? And if your identity is anything less than Christ crucified and risen, then who are you? Root yourself in Christ crucified and risen and don't settle for anything less. Also, do not envy the prosperity of others and do not seek to imitate those to whom God has entrusted different things. How often have we, I include myself here, looked upon other churches and their numbers, budgets, and events with jealousy 
while ignoring the gifts and blessings God has given to us. The Spirit gives generously according to our need, and there has never been a time when the Spirit has not provided exactly what was needed. So use the gifts God has given to you. Embrace the fact that you are a smaller family congregation. Look around you. For you can actually come to know and walk beside everyone in this room. How many of the big ones can say that? They can't. So do not fear your limitations, for God's grace is more than sufficient for you. And I would encourage you in one more thing, my brothers and sisters. I speak to you as a fellow servant of King Jesus who longs for nothing more than your success and growth. And the greatest command given to all Christians, as you should hopefully know by this point, um, is to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. No one could ever question your heart. And you really shouldn't limit your strength. You're pretty good at that. And in the pursuits of the mind, actually, to what you know, that's my, my jam, you have grown immensely in the past few years. However, do not neglect the soul. For this is where I think you are the most vulnerable. To love the Lord your God with all of your soul is to be at rest in the presence of God. It is to anchor yourself to Christ in prayer, fasting, and meditation. It is in the quiet stillness of the soul where we encounter true peace and assurance in the power of God. And brothers and sisters, you are a people of the heart and strength. Your passion burns bright and you yearn to act on it. You have grown in matters of the mind as well, so you actually have sort of a framework in which to work with things, which is good. And it should be commended. However, without growing and loving God with our soul, it is incomplete. Because this is the thing. How many times have we, with great enthusiasm, begun something new and exciting only for it to collapse within months? Because there was no rest. There was no peace. How many get caught? How many people get caught in a cycle of endless service, their strength sapped away because we have no conception of rest? How often have we let excitement and enthusiasm override wisdom and patience? And when was the last time we let big decisions be guided by prayer and fasting? Because sometimes the best action is to simply be still and know that he is God. Without the anchor of the soul, the heart may burn bright for a time, but that flame will fade and only ashes of what used to be will remain. Without the anchor of the soul, the mind may discover wondrous new things about God and his nature, but all these amount to nothing without that personal, personal commitment and trust in his presence. And without the anchor of the soul, your strength will be ground to dust under the weight of the never-ending needs of other people. Now, I say this to you not to shame you or to get on to you or to blast cannons as something, but to encourage you to keep growing. I can only say this because I know and have seen the things that by God's grace and abundant power you are capable of. You are capable of overcoming any weakness. And over these last seven years, you have grown so much. I simply tell you to keep going. Don't stop. Everyone has weakness. Everyone has areas that need to shore up. I simply believe that that is yours. And at mine too. Now, my beloved, I will miss you more than you can imagine. Every time I ever visited my father's house, it was only a matter of days before I longed to return to you, to this place where I belonged. And now that longing will be permanent. I have no fear of what lies ahead, for Christ is faithful and true but I do lament what I must leave behind. And so to David and Sherry, my co-workers in Christ, I pray that your ministry continues to be blessed and a blessing to others. Rick, Meg, 
Sam, the hips, thank you. I will miss you. Thank you for including me in your family so many times over the years. Betty and Meta, who I still have as a pair in my head and will probably always will be, uh, I will miss coming into the office and seeing you. I already miss coming in and seeing Betty sometimes, but I will miss seeing you and talking to you and all the conversations and things we have. Uh, Rebecca, my favorite questioner, my book buddy. I will miss our book clubs and all the uh, times you ask me questions that make me go, huh, I never thought of that. It's good. I like it. To Jean and Carol, the, first, the very first who took me in, gave me a place to do laundry, I will miss you. To Alan and Susan and Amelia and Sadie, my friends, these past seven years, thank you for all the hospitality, the support, the encouragement that you have provided. And the late night movie runs, of course. To Terry and Teresa, my twin and his better half, <laughs> thank you so much for all the fun, the hospitality, and of course, our movie discussions, whether they be in agreement or um, not. To Rodney and Jill and Brennan, my dearest friends, um, I will miss all the laughing fits, <laughs> watching Troy, and the time we spend together. To Mike, to Susan, to Beth, Matthew, and Nathan, my adopted family, I will miss you dearly, and all the games and adventures and other random songs we come up with at the dinner table because we're that weird. To Aaron and Kristen, Anna, Anna, Emily, and Jenna, my companions in time and space. I will miss our deep conversations, Bible studies, and of course, the haircuts, and the every, everything else. And Dean, my true friend and mentor, I will miss our breakfasts, our venting sessions, where I don't, it quickly becomes, I don't know who is supposed to be venting to who, and, but most of all, Dean, I will miss your kindness. And if I need another bookshelf, I will call you. <laughs> and I could keep going ad nauseum and on and on and on, the stuff everybody, but time is against us. So, my brothers and sisters in Christ, this is the end of a season. I can only pray that my time here has helped you know Jesus better. You have certainly helped me grow in that regard. And in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, may you be blessed. And may the face of the Lord Jesus be ever near to you. May mercy and grace flood this place. And may you continue to seek God in all that you do. Amen. And so you can get communion ready. As we take it together. It And one of the cool things about communion, I think, is as we take this, yes, we are communing with God and with Jesus Christ. That is true. We're remembering his death. We're proclaiming his death. We're proclaiming his resurrection. We're proclaiming the whole gospel, really. But we're also communing with all those who are in Christ. It's Christ and all those. It's the whole church gathered together at the table, living and dead. And so... Though I am going, every time you take this, and I am also taking this, and don't worry, I'm not leaving church, so you don't worry about that. We'll be eating together with all those who are around the world and with all those who have gone before. We meet at the great family feast of Christ to say, yes, he died, and he is alive. Hallelujah. So let's pray. Father, we thank you again for your blessings. And Father, of course, most of all, we thank you for Jesus. Thank you for his death. Thank you for his resurrection. And Lord, thank you that he is coming back. Father, be with us all as we celebrate the King. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And Father, we'll come to you with the fruit of the vine of this cup, 
the blood that was spilt on our behalf. Father, help us, all of us, wherever we go, wherever, whoever we may be, wherever we may, whoever we may meet, to be people washed in the blood, people who radiate Jesus wherever we go, to be people who proclaim the glories of your Son. And with the help of your Holy Spirit, I know that we can be faithful, just as you are always faithful. Amen. And Father, as we go from here, I ask that you bless this congregation and keep them. Keep them safe. Be faithful to them as you always are and help them to be faithful to you. It's in the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Please stand.